Let us pray. Father, as we now enter into the portion of this service where we are, where we have entered into the preaching of the word, Father, would you help me as I preach your word? Would you help your people to understand your word? We ask that your spirit would be upon uh, your word today and give life to it. And Father, that whatever you would like to speak to us during this message, that you would minister to us, that we might leave uh, differently and more changed than we came in. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So on this Lord's Day, we're making a remembrance of the day of Pentecost. Now, most call it the birthday of the church. And it is indeed the day in which, as we just read, the Holy Spirit came down upon her. Now, this was the first major working of the Holy Ghost that the apostles had seen without Jesus being physically present in body with them. Jesus, who had been with them for 40 days after his resurrection, before he ascended to his throne on high at the right hand of God, said this, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now this word, Pentecost, is directly translated into English from the Greek word Pentecostos, which is the 50th day after the Jewish Passover, counting from the second day of the feast. It was about 50 days. This puts it in perspective. It was about 50 days since the disciples had last, had set at the Last Supper with our Lord sharing the bread and wine before His crucifixion. Now, if you're following the Julian calendar, which most Western Christians do, uh, Pentecost was last Sunday, and today is Trinity Sunday. But if you are following the Gregorian calendar, it is to be celebrated today, Pentecost. And nevertheless, June is the Pentecost season. The church has always made a special remembrance of this particular event in church, church history. And it's a very important event because it's when the scriptures stop recording Old Testament Israel's history and they start recording the New Testament churches. Pentecost is also the dividing line uh, that will set the church at odds with the rulers and the false Israelites who are not accepting the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. So upon examining the events on Pentecost, I want to point out three um, main things that we see here. Number one, we see the consolation as the Spirit comes. Number two, we see the confounding or the confusion as the church experiences this gift of tongues. And three, we see the conversion of many to the faith of Jesus Christ. So first we see the consolation. There was no doubt that the disciples were very nervous. This was a time of great uncertainty for them. They had been with Jesus for over three years now. They'd witnessed things which no words could accurately describe. They had watched Judas Iscariot turn against and betray their beloved master. They had watched their Lord become sin on Calvary for the sins of the world. They had waited nervously at Christ's tomb as His body laid in there for three days and three nights. They waited nervously as Christ's body laid in the tomb. They had witnessed the risen Christ who arose victoriously from the dead to prove His power and victory over sin and death. And after 40 days of further instruction... Christ ascended finally to His heavenly throne. His heavenly throne which He had left for our sakes. 
and he returned to his glory and the glory of the Father. But while Christ was with his apostles, he had told them, John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And so these were the words at this point that the apostles in the early church were resting upon with their whole lives. Jesus had ascended, and yet, and they knew that the Lord would send the Holy Spirit, but they did not know when this would take place until it happened on the day of Pentecost. And of course, when Pentecost came, there was no mistaking that what Jesus had promised was coming to pass. Finally, their waiting for the Holy Ghost had come to an end and they had found consolation. They had found consolation because God the Holy Ghost was with them and He was now empowering them in their gospel ministrations. They would now have the holy unction from heaven they needed to carry out the great commission that the Lord had entrusted to them. And so you can see that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit turns their anxiety and uncertainty into boldness and confidence, which is the very nature and purpose of this outpouring. It was not that the Holy Spirit was not previously working in the lives and souls of men, but this act of pouring out the Spirit upon the early disciples, unifying them in the same consolation and in the same empowerment, was what was needed to give birth to the church as a bona fide institution of God Himself. The Holy Ghost is called the Comforter in John's Gospel, or other translations use the word Helper. And the word Comforter is translated from the Greek word parakletos which means one who comes alongside to strengthen. And this is why our Lord told them, I will send you another comforter. I will send you another helper. You know, these disciples, they'd already experienced the work of the Holy Spirit. Not only inwardly, as they were themselves drawn to Christ and transformed by Him as they walked with Him, but they had also experienced the work of the Holy Spirit outwardly through signs and wonders done both by the hands of Christ and they themselves. Christ, if you remember back in, in the Gospel accounts, He had given them power. And this power was the power of the Holy Spirit. It says in Matthew's Gospel, when He had called unto, the, unto Him His twelve disciples, He gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And so these disciples, they were no strangers. They were not strangers to the work of the Holy Spirit. Yet this day of Pentecost was the event that set the Christian dispensation, if you will, into motion. And of course we're told that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And so we see the, the consolation. Secondly, I'd like to point out that we see uh, the confounding. Now, there's much confusion about what occurred on the day of Pentecost. We know that the apostles spoke in tongues, but what kind of tongues? Unknown tongues? You know, the, the, we, we, hear, we can read the Apostle Paul talk about unknown, unknown tongues in the, in the book of Corinthians. But what was the miracle on the day of Pentecost? Was it babbling the same three syllables over and over again? Was it gibberish? Or was it meaningful? Now the scripture reveals that these other tongues were other languages. As the word tongues, it's just an old English word for languages. And the miracle was that there were Jews from all around the world there at Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And the Holy Ghost gave the apostles the ability to preach Jesus Christ to these people in their own language. 
Languages which the apostles had never spoken before. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And, they, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so they began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. They did not speak what they wanted to speak. They did not prepare any kind of message. They spoke as the Spirit of God gave them the words to say. And it says there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded or confused, because that every man heard him, them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? This was a very miraculous thing to experience. And it is a, ver it's a, it's a, it's a thing that has never happened since this day, nor will ever happen again. It was a great miracle, which validated not only that God had made Jesus, whom the Jews had crucified, both Lord and Christ, but that Christ had also chosen these twelve Apostles to lead and shepherd his church. It validated Christ and it validated those whom Christ gave authority to, to be over his church. Now, this was also, you'll notice that Peter is the one who speaks first on the day of Pentecost. This was also the time of the Apostle Peter's full restoration. And when Christ rose from the dead, Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me three times? Peter had failed the Lord terribly because he had denied Christ. And God has, is now giving him another chance, giving him the opportunity to stand before Israel and speak on the behalf of Christ. And it was on this day of Pentecost that Peter preached one of the most Powerful, spirit-filled sermons that has ever been preached. Every time I read this sermon, I, I get chills. Acts 2.12, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. Peter is saying, Listen to me. And he stood up and he preached to them, and he preached to them how the Old Testament prophets had foretold of Christ, how that Christ would be crucified, and how that Christ would rise again. And he told them plainly that it was they, these unbelieving Jews, he said, you have killed your Lord and your God upon the cross. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. God is not only validating Christ and validating the church, with this redemptive act of sending the Holy Spirit. But he's also giving Israel undeniable evidence that Christ is Lord. And lastly, we see the conversion of many to Jesus Christ. It was after Peter's powerful message that those who had formally consented to the crucifixion were now being brought under conviction for it. Peter preached, For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Acts 2.39 The promise of the Holy Ghost was to be given to them, that is, believing Israel and believing Israel's children, not to the Jews only, but also to those who are afar off, to the Gentiles, both 
those of Israel and, both those of, and, and also those of the Gentiles whom God would specifically call out by His Spirit and draw them into union with Christ. And that is the only way that a man can be saved. A person is not able to come to the Lord Jesus Christ until he is effectually called into union with Him by faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're saved this morning, God singled you out. He called you. He gave you the promise of the Holy Ghost. He drew you. He convicted you. He turned your will to gladly come to Christ, your only Savior, for the salvation of your soul. Peter speaks of being called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. And that is indeed what must occur, if you will, be saved. You can see in the text that Peter's message began to tear at them. The Spirit of God began to woo them because at the end of the message it says, Now when they heard this, when they heard Peter's message, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And my friends, if someone is being effectually called by God into union with Christ, they will say, as these men on Pentecost, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Just as Saul of Tarsus said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Just as the Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? If you're being effectually called, you will want to make a diligent use of the means of grace. You will ask what you must do to become a Christian. You must repent of your sins, says the preacher. Yes, says the one being converted. I have renounced the devil and all his works. I regret that I am a sinner and that it is through my fault alone that I have sinned against the Lord. I now turn from all that is not pleasing to God and I endeavor after new obedience to God's commandments. You must believe in the Lord Jesus, says the preacher. Yes, says the one being converted. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, crucified and risen, and that He is my only hope in life and death. Now Christ commands us to be baptized and join ourselves to a local church body, says the preacher. Look, here is water, says the one being converted. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Those who came under conviction on the day of Pentecost did just this. They asked in desperation, what should we do? They realized they were lost. And they asked in desperation, what must I do? And then they obeyed from, that, from their hearts the form of doctrine that was delivered unto them by the apostles. They were then baptized and then they were brought into the life of of the church. Brothers and sisters, if we long to see revival in the masses coming to Christ, what we need more than anything else are ministers who are willing to preach the Word of God in such a way that their preaching can be used as a means to bring true conviction and true conversion to the souls of men. You know, we live in a day of hardened hearts. And only the Spirit of God, through the preaching of the Word, can soften them. What was Peter's reply to these men who were pricked in their heart? Peter said unto them, Repent. We must understand that one cannot repent unless they are first broken hearted over their sin. And, and these men were. They were pricked in their heart. Peter was plain with them, as any good preacher of the gospel should be, telling them, he said, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Peter told them boldly, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He did what any good preacher of the gospel would do. He exposed their sin, and then he calls them to repentance and faith. 
And it says, And then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them 3,000 souls. They received his message, even though it pricked them in the heart. They did not roll their eyes. They did not walk out of the church. They did not say, oh, that preacher is being too harsh. No, they received. They came to the Lord. They repented and they were baptized. Now, before the day of Pentecost, there was around 120 disciples. And that was it. But now there's over 3,000. And they're now openly identifying themselves with Christ through baptism. And it says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and of prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And so what do we see here with these people? They're repenting. They're being baptized. They are continuing daily in the things of God. What we see here is genuine conversion to Christ. These 3,000, which were saved and baptized on Pentecost, they did not make their profession and then go back to the manner of living which they had before. No, no, no. What does the Scripture say? That after they repented, after they believed, after they were baptized, it says they continued... They kept going steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and of prayers. But we have many in the church, universal, who come into various congregations and make professions of faith. We have many who say they want to join the church. But then after a few weeks, they're nowhere to be found. You couldn't send an FBI agent to find them. These people claim they're interested in partaking in that heavenly congregation with the saints in light. But they don't seem to be interested in partaking in the congregation of the Lord now. My friends, if you don't enjoy being with the saints on the Lord's day now, to continue in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and of prayers, if you don't enjoy those things, then you'll certainly not enjoy being a part of that heavenly congregation with the saints in light, which is coming hereafter. We must understand that if the grace of God is in a person, and the grace of God has converted their soul to Christ and has saved them, they will continue in the faith. They will continue in the doctrine which was once delivered to us by the apostles. It says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And one thing we see here is that it is only the Lord who can add to the church. I cannot add to the church. You cannot add to the church. Only God can take a lost sinner, prick his heart, draw him to Christ, wash him in the blood of Christ, regenerate him by the Spirit of God, and make him a new creature. Only God can do this. We may be able to get people in the church physically, but only God can get them in spiritually. And there are many indeed who are sitting in churches this very morning who are there physically physically. But they are not there spiritually. Jesus said, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ is going to build his church. The devil can't stop him. Sinful man cannot stop him. We cannot hinder him. But this doesn't mean that he is going to build his church without means. He's going to use the church to bring souls to Christ. And the truth is, if we're going to be effective in winning souls for Christ, we've got to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And salvation is a work of God alone, and so is revival. 
The new birth is supernatural. We know that people cannot save themselves. Only God can do these things. Only God can send the Spirit. I mean, this day of Pentecost is a type and shadow of what has to happen to every Christian. And I'm not speaking of the, the sign gifts that were going on in the apostolic era, but I'm talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit is a type and shadow of what must happen to everyone who is going to enjoy the eternal blessedness in the kingdom of heaven. The Spirit must come down upon you, and He must give you life. Without it, you will remain dead in your trespasses and your sins. We must, like Peter, rest in God's power. We must live. We must walk in the Spirit. And God is going to use us as a means to point people to His Son. Let us also, dearly beloved, never forsake those great Reformation principles and the precise theology that was produced from that great move of God. But let us also maintain the fire. We don't want to forsake the, the great Reformation principles. We don't want to forsake the precise theology. But we, 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 must, we must maintain the fire. And many people associate Reformed theology with election and predestination. Of course, that's true. Those doctrines are a vital part of our systematic theology. But what many do not realize is that Reformed theology puts a greater emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit than it does on predestination and election. You know, some would sum up the Reformed doctrines with the sentence, God is sovereign. I don't necessarily disagree with that. He most certainly is sovereign. He's sovereign over all things. He's sovereign even over our salvation. But if I were to sum up the Reformed doctrines, I would simply repeat the words of Christ when He said, Without me, you can do nothing. And that is essentially what it is to be reformed. It is to acknowledge that nothing good, nothing spiritually good, nothing, nothing pleasing to God can happen without the work of the Holy Spirit. We must be careful not to get buried into our theology and think that knowledge alone is sufficient. You know, an engineer can know every detail of a car he has designed without, he can know it inside and out. He can know every part of the car, for he has designed these parts himself. But without fuel, that car is going nowhere. No matter how much he knows about the car, the engine will not fire without a spark in gasoline. It will not happen. Knowledge is nothing without power to apply it. For knowledge alone, as the scripture says, merely puffs up. You know, the Bible is our sole rule of faith and practice. It contains all things necessary unto salvation. It contains all things that are necessary to exercise ourselves unto godliness. It is, it is sufficient to truly furnish us unto all good works. But something that we must take notice here Something we must take notice of here is that Pentecost came first. Before the New Testament was given to the church, the Holy Spirit was given. And though tongues have ceased, as we are taught in the 13th chapter of the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, though many of those, though the apostolic sign gifts have ceased, 
There's no reason in the world that we cannot be theologically orthodox and yet at the same time have the fire of Pentecost. There's no reason in the world that we should accept a dry orthodoxy. And Christians have far too long had an either-or mentality in this regard. One side says, if we're going to be theologically precise, we must take a fully academic approach. Others say, if we want the power of the Holy Spirit, let's forget theology. Let's, who cares about being precise? We need to focus on empowerment. My friends, we need both theological precision and empowerment from the Holy Spirit. We need both of these things. It's not an either-or mentality. It's a both and. We need it all. We need all that God can give us, both through His written Word and the power that comes from on high through the Holy Spirit. We need both of these things. We need to be orthodox and have the fire. Now, Pentecostal fire is what swept Israel in these days. Even, you, you'll read as you continue through the book of Acts, all the persecutions that the church was enduring. And yet the church is growing, it's prospering. There's power there. The Holy Spirit empowers us to put biblical truth into action. And any true revival starts with people who are solid in the truth. There are many so-called revivals out there that started with people, they were already in heresy. And the so-called revival only deepened it. But true revival, and there have been many true revivals since the day of Pentecost, Any true revival starts with people who are solid in the truth. And then a fire breaks out. A fire that has been started with hearts that are prepared already to be ignited. And then the Spirit of God comes and ignites them. Now I long to see a, a moving of the Spirit of God like we see in the days of the Reformers, in the days of the First Great Awakening with Wesley and Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. You know, in a few weeks we're going to be uh, reading, or I'm going to be reading in the Sunday night service, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards, which was preached on July the 8th, 1741. And this was the sermon that was said to have sparked, to have ignited. God used it to ignite the first great awakening, which resulted in thousands, thousands of souls being saved. These men experienced Pentecostal power when they saw thousands coming, when Whitfield was standing in the field and see thousands coming to him to listen to the Word of God, that's Pentecostal power. We must pray. We must seek the Lord's face that He might in His mercy prick the hearts of stone in this country and in this world so that we can see revival. As we see that it all started when Peter preached the word, then these men were pricked in their hearts. And then they bowed before the truth saying, all right, what do we do now? Peter says, repent, be baptized, get into the church and be faithful. My fellow Christians, if we're ever to do something for the Lord, we must seek to be empowered by the Holy Ghost. And the only way you can seek the power of the Holy Ghost in your life is to spend time with the Lord in prayer. 
Jesus said, The Father will not withhold the Holy Spirit from those who ask Him. My friends, yes, if you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. But you do not always have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The empowerment which came upon the church on this day we're speaking of here, the day of Pentecost. So we must seek this empowerment. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Holy Spirit. Thank You for not leaving us comfortless, but You have sent the Comforter from Heaven, the Spirit of Christ to indwell us, to empower us. We pray even now that You would Give us a greater measure of your Holy Spirit that we might be used in a mighty way to further your kingdom. Not that we may glory in it, but that Christ may get all the glory. Father, we know that without the work of your Spirit, we can do nothing. And without the power of your Spirit, your church can do nothing but function in its dead, in, in dead orthodoxy, which has no life to it. May we never, may we never be satisfied until we have not only the precise theology, but also the power, the fire from on high, which your Holy Spirit brings unto us. We need you now more than ever. Give us boldness through the power of the Holy Spirit, to stand for your word in this evil and corrupt generation in which we live. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.